So I'm very inspired by all of the speakers that have spoken here today. And I just want to start out with uh, taking some inspiration from Sasana and getting everybody moving a little bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say a statement. I'd like everyone to keep your arms raised. So put your hands up. And I'm going to say a statement. And if you agree with me, keep your hands raised. If you disagree with me, put your hand down. Okay. So arms up. We'll start with some easy ones. I love boba. If you love boba, keep your hand raised. I see arms shooting straight up. OK, perfect. I love ramen. <laughs> we got some new recruits. OK. I love pizza. OK, great. You guys are really understanding this game. Excellent. So I'm going to get a little harder. So again, you keep your hand raised if you agree with me. If you disagree with me, put your arm down. I have never been discriminated against or treated badly because of the way I look. I lose a lot of people. And then another hypothetical situation. I am an undocumented person who speaks English as a second language or doesn't speak English at all. And if I was un assaulted in the street, I would feel comfortable going to the police. No hands. Thank you for playing. This is a quick introduction to the themes I'm going to touch on today. So thank you for the introduction, Wendy. Um, so I'm, an, I'm here today as a nonprofit executive director, as an emergency physician, as a mother of a two and a half year old who I pulled into this photo shoot, um, as a pregnant person, as a second generation daughter of Indian immigrants. So just wanted to introduce myself a little bit more. So as an emergency doctor, I spend my day and night often just splinting, suturing, placing lines, resuscitating, doing CPR, often, not that often, but almost once a shift, um, bringing someone from the brink of death back to life. That's part of your job. And when your job can flip from an instant from life to death to life again, you become really good at recognizing patterns. Pattern recognition really helps us as emergency doctors make clinical decisions very quickly and often without any, not a lot of knowledge. Just you come in a room, someone's unconscious, you have to put it all together really quickly. And the byproduct of this often daunting work is that you also become a very keen observer of life, of what tears people down and what brings people back together. So in my keen observership, I've become privy to the secret lives of my patients. I see grandparents and grandchildren breaking the rules and snuggling in stretchers together. I see mistresses sneaking kisses behind closed curtains. I see overworked mothers coming in at the end of the day, breaking down as we put their child on a 5150 or a psychiatric hold. And of course, I see all kinds of strange objects placed in all kinds of strange places inside people's bodies. <laughs> that is part of my job. But what I have become acutely aware of over the last few years is that loneliness, fear, and isolation have ravaged our communities here in the Bay Area. What I have also become acutely aware of is the fact that hateful rhetoric that comes in the form of political discourse in the news and on social media has real life consequences. When there's a rise in hate speech, there is a corresponding rise in violence. There's this concept called the Overton window. And what that is, is a way to model what is acceptable for a politician to get behind without risking losing electoral support. And that Overton window can shrink and contract. And what we saw happen in 2016 was that what was acceptable political discourse increased to a place to encompass things that were only thought of or seen or read in the darkest corners of the internet. And it became mainstream. When Trump tweeted the Chinese virus at the beginning of the pandemic, we saw an instant increase in incidences of anti-Asian hate. Political discourse matters. What people say matters. We saw the same thing happen in El Paso when 23 people were murdered in a Walmart. And the shooter endorsed all kinds of conspiracy theories that you could hear on Fox News. The point is, words matter. And violence is most easily perpetrated against our most invisible people. And who are the most invisible people in society? 
The most invisible people are often the people without papers, so our undocumented residents, and people who speak English as a second language or don't speak English at all. So just to give you a brief overview of demographics, and Mr. Go touched on this, you know, the, the AAPI community is not a monolith. In California, there are two million undocumented people approximately living here. In the Bay Area, we have approximately 300,000 undocumented people. Of that two million people who are undocumented, 15% identify as AAPI. One in four AAPI people living in California are working and are in poverty. So who are the most vulnerable people in California? It's the most invisible people. It's this community, often. And the model minority myth is a myth. It might be true in some ways, but it, more often than not, it's not true. And it's a way that's used to divide, to divide us. So what I found is that this hateful rhetoric was manifesting itself in a very real way with my patients. So I work over in the East Bay. I work at Kaiser Oakland in Richmond. So at Kaiser Oakland, which is right next to Chinatown, I, in the last few years I've seen many incidences of anti-Asian violence that have taken place, either random or not so random. I've also seen non-physical violence take place in the form of extreme isolation, fear, and loneliness. I was working a shift last night until midnight, and my last patient was a 90-year-old gentleman. He was born in China. He'd probably been living here about 40 years, very well you know, acculturated to Oakland. He was an Oaklander. And up until two years ago, he was taking five to six mile walks every single day. So three times a day, he would go out, and he just like Sasana's grandmother, go out, do his daily walk three times a day, six miles a day, an 88-year-old guy. And what his daughter told me is that over the last two years, he's been so terrified to leave his apartment that he stopped walking. And every single day, he got weaker and weaker and more and more frail to the point where yesterday, he slipped. He just slipped on his own carpet and he landed on his bottom. And he couldn't get up. And that's why he, that's how he came to me. He can't move. It wasn't... This is someone who was walking five or six miles a day two years ago, and because of fear and loneliness, this is the condition he's in. In Richmond, where I also spend half my time, 40 or 50 percent of my patients are uninsured, and probably a large percentage of them are also undocumented. And what I noticed back in 2016 is that my patients were coming in from this demographic much later and much sicker because of fear of deportation. You probably remember in the news, there were all of these reports, oh, ICE is coming, they're gonna to come to the hospitals, they're gonna to come to the schools. And there were some incidences of that happening, ICE is Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And I remember I had a 42-year-old El Salvadorian construction worker who came in. He'd had a heart attack two weeks prior. Classic, chest pain, sweating, numbness of the arm. And his sister tried to get him to go to the ER, but he wouldn't go because he saw what he thought was ICE presence around the hospital. It was actually just our hospital police. But he didn't come. And every day, his heart muscle got weaker and weaker, and more and more of it died, to the point where I saw him. And your heart, which is supposed to beat at 60%, really strong, is beating at 20%. A 42-year-old man is permanently disabled because of fear and xenophobia and hateful rhetoric. So that's when I, that, that's been my call to action. It's my community, the people I take care of, the people I live with, the people I care about are being ravaged by a false and hurtful and hateful rhetoric. Something I know is not true. I grew up as a, in, all my friends were Indian, all my parents' friends were Indian, all the places I've lived and trained in New York and here have been multicultural. I know how vibrant and wonderful the immigrant community can be, all the different diasporas. It takes a lot of grit and resilience to move from one country to another, either voluntarily, voluntarily or involuntarily. So that was my call. Okay, how can I shed light on what the truth really is? And so I was pondering. 2016, drinking a lot of wine, watching a lot of Netflix, not really sure what to do. And I came across this skit by Trevor Noah. And he's talking about 
It's from the son of Patricia, and he's talking about, okay, if you hate immigrants, then you're not allowed to eat their food. You are only allowed to eat potatoes. <laughs> Even that's debatable. Uh, but if, you, if you're only allowed to eat potatoes, you're definitely not allowed to eat salt or have any spice, because without, and without immigrants, there's no spice. No immigrants, no spice. Yeah. And I was like, okay, this, this makes sense. This hits me in my gut, hits me in my heart. I understand this. So naturally, I emailed his lawyers and I said, can I take this phrase and trademark it and start selling t-shirts and for charity? And they, they were like, yeah, whatever. Who are you? <laughs> and so I did. So I started selling t-shirts and donating it for direct legal action. And from that point, No Immigrants, No Spice has morphed into what it is today, which is a 501c3 nonprofit where we focus on bringing people together around food as a way to talk about immigration. So we do all kinds of targeted social programming, online events, but now we're back to live events like this one that we did in 2019. And what's coming up in May is something called Barbecue Without Borders. And what we're doing is we're inviting a Cuban chef, an Indian chef, and a Japanese chef to give their own riff on barbecue. So it's no hot dogs, no hamburgers, it's yakitori, tandoori, lechon. And it's talking about their stories through their food. We're building physical mini marts or bodegas where you can go and reflect on their journey, on their migration story, find recipes and tools that their grandparents used to cook. And really, what it is is a way to foster community around food in a non-polarizing way. And in a very sneaky way, it's a way to introduce and get people to get on board with immigration. We're also raising money for our resilience fund, which is a it's like a community bank for undocumented people to get $500 for whatever you need. Fix your car, take care of your kids, pay your bills, no questions asked. But the real, so we can raise money, we can have these events. The, the real goal of the work, if we can do anything, is to humanize immigrants. So if, if you love boba, and you love ramen, and you love pizza, maybe that could be an entry point for you to care about the people who are making that boba and that pizza and making your ramen. Maybe we can take it even further to care about the people who are out in the fields when there's fires and unsafe working conditions who are still picking our food, who are almost completely undocumented. If we can care, if we can start to care just a little bit and humanize people, there'll be less hate. And that's our call to action. So on that note, I wanted to close with some favorite foods of some of the people that we're honoring here today. Sorry. Hyun Jung Grant made delicious bowls of kimchi jjigae for her family. Soon Cha Kim traded Korean won for American dollars so she could buy pizza at the US military base. She loved American culture and she loved American pizza. Soon Chung Park loved to make kimchi dumplings for Chusok. Susana Yi and her grandmother, Yi Ok Hong, shared many things, including their mutual love of steamed fish. Thank you for being here today. <laughs>